It is over 4,000 miles from the busy seaport of Rotterdam, Holland, to this North Dakota farmstead. But these two places are closer than you might guess. For Europe, North Dakota, and many other parts of the world are connected by an intricate pipeline through which North Dakota wheat flows in an almost unending stream. North Dakota farmers plant four basic cereal grains. Barley, both for malting and animal feed, and three different classes of wheat. The most important is hard red spring. It's the high protein, strong gluten wheat that produces light and airy bread products preferred everywhere. The second class of North Dakota wheat is hard amber durum, the pasta wheat. It makes the best spaghetti and macaroni products in the world. The third is hard red winter wheat, presently grown only in small amounts in North Dakota. Getting in the crop is an important part of farming and must be done quickly with big power machinery, whether it's wheat or North Dakota's newest crop, sunflowers. Farming is at best a risky business. Farmers have to depend on the variables of weather, stay one step ahead of insects and weeds, and gamble on the economic ups and downs of the grain market. Fortunately, North Dakota's climate is ideal for growing high protein cereal grains. And chemical sprays help reduce the risks created by harmful weeds and insects. Perhaps you never thought of wheat as a flowering plant, but it is. Each blossoming bloom to house a single kernel of grain at maturity. If the farmer's gamble with nature is paid off, both the Durham and hard red spring wheat fields will be golden with grain and the yearly harvest ritual can begin. Getting the crop out is just as big a job as getting it in, requiring even more big power assisted machinery. As a general rule, grain is first swathed or cut and then left in the field to dry. Again, timing is very important as the grain should be swathed a little on the green side. North Dakota wheat fields look like this for several days. Just as close to the right moment as possible, the grain is picked up and threshed. Two different types of combines, self-propelled, as well as tractor-drawn, comb the windrows, gleaning the wheat farmer's end product, grain for the world. Sometimes farmers combine both jobs and conserve precious energy by letting the grain ripen fully. Then they cut and thresh the grain in one operation. Both the farmer and his machines need refueling during the day. At a lunch break, the farmer and his helpers enjoy the fruits of other farmers' harvests. This apple was grown in Washington. The orange came from Florida. The coffee was grown in Central America. And this bunch of bananas was shipped all the way from a South American plantation. This lunch would be impossible without foreign trade. Growing and harvesting any crop is only the beginning. Getting it to the hungry people of the world is equally important. For North Dakota wheat, that journey starts when the farmer trucks it down to his local elevator. After buying the farmer's grain, the elevators move it on to milling companies for processing. But before it can be shipped, it must be sold again. To arrive at a fair price, buyers and sellers of grain use the services of the Minneapolis Grain Exchange. Although similar exchanges exist in other cities, this is the only one that handles North Dakota wheat. The process has been computerized in recent years, making the job easier. There are two sides to the exchange, the cash market and the futures market. 
People dealing in futures gather in an area known as the pit and must wait until the opening bell rings before trading. With one eye on the big board where grain transactions are automatically posted, buyers and sellers of grain bid with each other for business. These prices are continuously changing, reflecting the ups and downs of the market as the bidding goes on, here and at other exchanges elsewhere. Some of the grain which is causing all this excitement hasn't even been grown yet. In the futures market, grain for delivery at a later date is bought and sold. The market was developed so that all segments of the grain industry could reduce their business risk. Toward the end of the trading period, bidding becomes even more wild, as the exchange members try for just a little more edge for their companies. The sound of a bell indicates that the market is about to close. Soon the activity stops, until the same time the next day. Where the futures market exists to fill long-range needs, the cash market handles present or short-range requirements. In the cash market, carloads of grain actually in transit are represented by a small sample in a pan. As they have for over 100 years, Buyers and sellers get together and bargain. The supply source asking and the demand side bidding in one-eighth cent increments. The sellers represent country elevator accounts while the buyers usually work for millers or export houses. Market news services provide traders with worldwide crop reports, weather reports, foreign and domestic political news, recent technological developments, currency fluctuations, and many other factors that can affect trading prices. They're essential to hone a trader's judgment. There are over 25 privately owned and cooperative firms that deal in the worldwide export of North Dakota wheat. Some, like Cargill, are large and maintain offices around the world where grain merchants, in constant communication with each other, keep an eye on international trade. Grain exporters have to be experienced in every aspect of international trade. Jim Howard and Bob Kohlmeyer share some of their views on the subject. Contracting to uh, sell wheat abroad really isn't uh, a great deal different from selling wheat domestically in the United States. The main difference is uh, one of scale. A uh, normal uh, sale overseas today would involve uh, anywhere from 25,000 to 50,000 tons uh, of wheat in one shipment. And sometimes a particular tender by a foreign buyer might involve 300,000 tons of wheat. Between 50 and 60 percent of U.S. wheat production is sold overseas. Domestically, consumption of wheat and wheat products appears to have leveled off and is, is adjusted really only by population growth. So that the true growth market for the U.S. wheat producer is the overseas market. The overseas market, represented by this large European flour mill, requires a steady flow of wheat to keep up with the demand for bread and pasta products. So millers the world over buy all classes of wheat, both hard and soft, both winter and spring varieties, and they buy them in a wide range of protein levels. They're blended together to produce a flour to the baker's exact specifications. The European economic community grows a considerable amount of wheat. Both bread wheats and macaroni durum, even identical varieties grown in North Dakota. However, in the baking process, most of the European grown wheat flours need additional gluten strength. To fill this deficiency, European millers import high protein, strong gluten wheat to augment the weaker continental varieties. So North Dakota wheat is in a favorable position because of its quality. But because wheat is grown all over the world, competition price-wise in the world market is intense. We really have been fortunate, and are fortunate today, I think from the farm right through to the consumer, wherever we may be in this country or overseas, to enjoy a free market system. That gives the farmer the opportunity to make his judgments as to what he wants or thinks he needs to have for his wheat. It gives the buyer, wherever he may be, the opportunity to make those same kind of judgments. Really, the U.S. free market economy, market system, if you will, 
is the bellwether pricing system for the world on wheat. Now that doesn't mean that always the U.S. wheat is the cheapest because other of other countries which compete with us, uh, they know what our wheat is worth. They, they, the futures market, for instance, that we have is, uh, is the main price reference point for the world in pricing wheat. The world is a giant wheat market. Somewhere every month of the year, wheat is being harvested and sold. It's a principal source of man's food supply. North Dakota wheat now begins the first leg in the journey from the local elevator to a flour mill somewhere in the world which needs it. Once a dusty and dangerous job, grain handling is today much less hazardous due to improved equipment. Specifically designed hopper cars are always in demand as they are one of the more economical means of shipping wheat. But they are not always available and shortages develop especially during harvest time. So the shipping of North Dakota wheat by truck is another flourishing business. How wheat is shipped is a very important factor. The means of transportation, the cost of diesel fuel, the distance traveled, all affect what price grain traders must get for the wheat. Grain sold for international use now goes to a big terminal elevator in a large city. For North Dakota wheat, there are really only three market possibilities. In the shipping season, most North Dakota export grain moves to either Duluth Superior or Minneapolis, although some does go west to Pacific ports. The eastbound grain then moves from Duluth Superior through the St. Lawrence Seaway while Minneapolis grain goes by barge down the Mississippi River to Gulf ports. In the winter, it all moves by either truck or rail. Terminal elevators are usually located on waterways because the most economical method of shipment is by barge or bulk carrier vessel. The port of Duluth Superior, for example, located at the head of the St. Lawrence Seaway, is a good starting point for European and other Atlantic port destinations. North Dakota wheat bound for the Orient and other Pacific ports may be shipped by truck or rail to terminals either in Portland or Seattle. Terminals with capacities of millions of bushels fill ocean-going bulk carrier ships the year round. This Minneapolis terminal uses the Mississippi River to ship wheat to southern destinations. The bulk carriers employed here are barges, which move wheat to mills in cities downstream. Large terminal elevators located in New Orleans regularly unload a part of this barge traffic. These rotating buckets can hold many bushels of grain in a single bite. Now the process of actually shipping North Dakota wheat overseas begins. The grain has been trucked or hauled by rail to the seaport terminal elevator. In this case, it's Duluth, Minnesota. The grain arrives in a steady stream. When the trucks reach the weigh-in point, a technician plunges a probe into the load of wheat. This takes a sample of the wheat for testing. This instrument is designed to make a representation of the entire load, not just the grain on top. The sample is taken by air duct to the laboratory where it's cleaned and graded. This grading is only for bin assignment purposes. The official grade is determined by automatically sampling the grain stream inside the elevator under strict federal supervision. The sample is weighed and then sifted, separating the grain from the dockage. It's inspected and gone through kernel by kernel to determine a particular quality or the percentage of foreign material. At the terminal, machinery quickly unloads both trucks and rail cars. This facility can dump over 350 big grain trucks every day and also unload 60,000 bushels of wheat an hour from railroad cars. The grain is discharged onto conveyor belts that carry out computer commands. These belts are totally enclosed to keep the air free of grain dust and keep fire hazards to a minimum. 
the computer monitors all aspects of handling and storage, electronically routing the wheat to bins where other wheat of identical quality is stored. Computer technicians operate the elevator's maze of electronic gear, all designed and built to facilitate the ease of grain handling. To sell the North Dakota wheat now binned in the terminal elevator is the next job of the grain exporter, if it has not already been accomplished. A contract results from negotiations, and the quantity and quality is agreed upon. Different types of sales are possible and must be agreed on by both the buyer and the seller. One of the most common types of sales is what we refer to as an FOB sale, a sale made free on board an ocean carrier provided by the buyer, where the seller's obligation ceases at the end of the elevator discharge spout. In all FOB prices, the exporter must include these costs, the grain, handling, storage, interest, allowance for losses, necessary certificates, fixed expenses, and hopefully a profit. Sometimes the bid will be at exact cost or lower just to keep the terminal elevator operating. The charges vary from firm to firm and from place to place. But this is not the only way wheat sales can take place. Sales can also be made on a delivered basis, commonly uh, referred to as C and F, meaning cost and freight, or CIF, meaning cost, insurance, and freight, where the seller is responsible for obtaining and providing suitable ocean tonnage to carry the grain he has sold to the uh, required destination that satisfies his sale and satisfies his foreign customer. Other factors which affect export sales are marine insurance, war risk insurance, pole to rail insurance, finance charges, commissions, stevedoring, full out turn guarantees, discharge costs, demurrage and dispatch, separation of cargo and holds, overtime, unexpected shutdowns, strikes, stoppages, and this isn't all. Grain markets are very sensitive to a variety of developments around the world. One thing we might run into, for instance, between the close of the futures market and the next day's opening is, uh, is an estimate of, uh, of, uh, of crop problems in China or Russia or some other important part of the world where these people are either likely buyers of our grain or they're uh, potential competitors for uh, United States wheat. Those kind of developments can cause the market the next day to open stronger. But the price paid for imported wheat is not completely regulated by the factors of supply and demand. National trade policies have a great deal to do with price. An example is in the Netherlands. 35% of the wheat in a pound of flour must be grown there. The other 65% can come from anywhere. In Japan, the government food agency acting through Japanese traders actually buys the wheat from around the world, imports it, and then retails it to the millers at a much higher price. Every country has its own import and tax laws which control the price of imported grain. Exportation policies are also important. The U.S. government has to maintain agricultural policies which continue to enhance and hopefully improve the ability of the U.S. farmer and the export merchant to export U.S. wheat in competition with wheat from other origins. By the same token, it is important that the U.S. government in its negotiations with our trading partners encourage those trading partners to remove barriers that might be in place which diminish, if not prevent, the export of U.S. wheat to certain destinations. International trading is a terribly complicated and risky procedure. When you think of the market fluctuations, the language barriers, the political differences, the shipping problems, the currency and exchange variations, plus an exporter keeping track of thousands of ships, cargoes, and so on, it makes you wonder what keeps them going. The wheat market or grain markets in this country are, are forever in motion. They're always moving. We never start from one point in time and uh, nor do we ever ever bring this really to an end. We are out bidding as merchants and exporters of grain. We are bidding for grain, for wheat, every day, all during the day. We are making offers of grain overseas as well as domestically most of the time during the day. That doesn't mean we're trading all the time, but there, we have to be willing to buy and we have to be willing to sell at all times if we're fulfilling our function. When a buyer has been secured, the North Dakota wheat is ready for its final journey. 
The St. Lawrence Seaway is open for shipping from April till December. Ships flying the flags of many nations regularly ply this Great Lakes route, carrying steel, fertilizer, and manufactured goods on the upbound trip, then cereal grains, oil seeds, and corn on the return. This vessel is the La Chakra, a typical bulk cargo ship designed to sail the St. Lawrence Seaway. She is now upbound through the seaway, carrying a load of steel from Antwerp, Belgium, to Detroit, Michigan, and Duluth, Minnesota. Soon the La Chakra is in position to receive her load of grain from a Duluth terminal. Once grain was loaded like this, pouring directly into the ship from spouts. Today, engineers have overcome the dust problems, and the grain is loaded by this method. The La Chakra's holds will carry 16,000 metric tons of hard red spring wheat. That's 588,000 bushels, or about 50 million loaves of bread. In order to make sure that wheat shipments meet the exact grade specified in the contract, sampling of the shipment is made during loading and supervised by the Federal Grain Inspection Service. After the ship is filled to seaway depth and inspected by the insurance company surveyor, the watertight hatches are closed for the journey. Every precaution is taken to protect the million and a half dollar cargo from the loss of quality risk. Assisted by tugboats, the big ship moves slowly away from the terminal. Soon the Lashakra passes grain carriers from many countries. Ships being loaded are waiting their turn for a load from other terminals at this busy seaport. It passes by the downtown area of Duluth and heads under the last bridge toward Lake Superior. About 24 hours after leaving Duluth, the ship enters the Sault Ste. Marie Locks, the passageway between Lake Superior and Lake Huron. The seaway provides a scenic voyage. Detroit, Michigan is approached through Lake St. Clair. As the La Chakra sails downbound past Detroit, she passes the city where just a few days before she discharged part of her cargo of European steel. It is on the Detroit River that the La Chakra completes the second day of her eastbound voyage. Dead ahead lies Niagara Falls, a dramatic and abrupt change in water level. It must be bypassed through a series of locks located along the Welland Canal, where the ship is slowly lowered in a step-by-step -step procedure. The vessel is 614 feet long and 75 feet wide, the maximum length and width permitted in the locks. This ultra-fast picture shows what happens slowly in one of the locks. There are eight locks in the Welland section and 16 locks all told in the seaway. The level of the water is 600 feet lower from Duluth to the Atlantic Ocean. It takes nearly 20 minutes for the ship to negotiate each lock. The pilot, a specialist in navigating the canal, guides the vessel through at a snail's pace. Three of the eight locks are twin locks, with ships going up and coming down at the same time. Once through the canal, the ship sails across Lake Ontario and into the Thousand Island area of the St. Lawrence River. This is a picturesque place, and the La Chakra slides silently along past old castles and summer homes. Seven more locks and the North Dakota wheat is out in the Atlantic Ocean, seven days away from Duluth and seven days left to go to reach its European destination, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. During the middle of the night, the La Chakra docks at Rotterdam. It's the world's busiest harbor and gateway to the canal system of Europe. Everywhere large cargo ships can be seen being unloaded from floating elevators, 
which move out into the harbor to empty the holes into barges. Barges also pick up loads of grain from terminal elevators in the harbor. The Lashakra is unloaded from both the terminal and by floating elevators. The grain is lifted out by vacuum, then it's weighed and transferred to river barges. the wheat is sampled for quality. There are barges everywhere in Rotterdam Harbor. They're usually operated by a family who live aboard the craft. Barges vary in size and draft depending on the river or canal network they regularly operate on. Almost everywhere in Europe can be reached by barge from Rotterdam. 16,000 cargo barges regularly ply the Rhine River. Most of the flour mills in Europe are located adjacent to a waterway. This mill is the largest in its country. Using the same loading device as floating elevators, the mill moves the grain out of the barge with air suction. The output of the mill also moves by water. This load of flour is destined for the African continent. Less than 5% of the grist is hard red spring wheat from North Dakota. The rest is European wheat. For the end product will be a pancake-like bread, which is favored in Africa. Foreign millers and wheat buyers frequently visit North Dakota farms and research facilities. The scientists who develop and test wheat varieties at North Dakota State University play an important part in marketing spring wheat and Durham abroad. They are in a good position to explain the annual crop quality survey produced for the State Wheat Commission. A wheat flour for Inogram is like a fingerprint. No two are exactly alike. But a milling expert can check certain wheat characteristics instantly by viewing a for Inogram. University personnel also go overseas to present informational seminars to local milling industry officials. This seminar was held in Dusseldorf, Germany. At the same time, they visit cereal chemists in many mills that grind the spring wheat in Durham. Balance of trade with foreign countries means imports should equal exports. These autos have just arrived in Seattle by ship. Now the vessel is being loaded with hard spring wheat for the return trip to Japan. Just a few short years ago, the Japanese did not import wheat products from the United States, but now they buy 100 million bushels annually, plus great quantities from Australia and Canada. North Dakota wheat, an important staple in the diets of so many, has now become an increasingly important part of the food supply for the world. Hard red spring wheat for bread and bread products and hard amber derm, a standard of quality the world over. Grown and harvested by the most efficient wheat producer the world has ever known, the American farmer, the North Dakota farmer.